one of the things that I'm, I guess, like, wrestling with now is, and I've noticed you talking about this, and, like, it seems like DF score is kind of your workaround for this, um, but, like, I'm super interested in implementing, like, the theory of max programming into notation, so, like, creating these cells, and then, like, this cell has a 70% chance of, like, being triggered by the performer, and this one has a 20% chance, and then they have a length of between four and six seconds, and half of it is just, like, trying to figure out how to convey that in some kind of visual form um, without just, like, inundating the performer with a bunch of info. I mean, there's there's an aspect of which I guess it depends on the aesthetic, so, like, some notational things are are meant to be overwhelming or obfuscating even to a point like where something like like Feldman's music where he'll have like purposefully uh, confusing notations like C sharps followed by B flats in, in series where what you're playing is the opposite of what you're seeing and it's done to get like I think his notational image or he had a, he had a term for what it was but there's something to be said for that like if, if you're attempting to communicate something via notation that's beyond what the specific notation is but i think for a lot of people they're not and it, the in, notation itself can act as a barrier for this other stuff so if, if you're speaking or, or thinking like probabilistically or algorithmically that can be very difficult to communicate in something short of like a really complex text um, like, you know, graphic score piece with like pages of instructions. I'm thinking specifically the stuff that I've done in the past, which is somewhat tedious, but I think um, there's some stuff that it, the, the performer themselves needn't be concerned with. Um, and it, then it's like as a compositional decision, like what what it is that you want the performers to be concerned with and then how to most effectively do that, you know? And I think, as you said, yeah, for me, the DF score was my way of trying to get around some of that. I... I I've revisited that idea in the last couple of years, which we can talk about in a bit in terms of like what I felt I wanted to improve and change. And I it like these days it's, it's quite radically different in terms of what I want from it and what it will then do. But part of it was I wanted to have something where not only could I, I show more useful information to the performer. So like just relevant information. So like, uh, uh, almost like just a, a, a much improved part score. So like you've got the part, you've got what you need. You've got like additional bits that might be useful um, but no more, like you don't need to see, you know, like a full score if, unless it's, it's relevant for a section. So a way of doing that and then having some kind of score, generic score following where it moves along as you move along. So there's a lot of perks that come with that approach, like in just a vanilla ballpark way, but then having the things, as you said, like having some kind of, um, algorithmic or dynamic components and, or, um, interactive components. So based on things that you have then performed, it will then make adjustments accordingly, which I think was, um, a fun thing for me to work on. I think in all earnestness, like I'm, I'm not a huge, like I haven't done a ton amount of work in just like algorithmic or generative composition. It, it isn't my background and it isn't a massive area of interest for me, but I think a lot of that thinking lives in that world, like just probabilities and having like, I, I made decisions about some of these numbers that like, go oh, between this, like, like building a Markov table from, or a Markov chain from like scratch, which is cool, but I, I don't know that any of those numbers were meaningful. You know, I, I just like, oh, I'll just do this to this and maybe this to this and this to this. And you're you're generally like opining, like just opinionating on things that are maybe not relevant, but also not a domain that you're massively interested in. Like like if a, a violinist asked you, do you prefer if I use like my lightly, my light colored violin or my dark colored violin? And it's like, I don't know. Like I can offer an opinion, but like it's uh it's not based on anything, you know? Like it's it's just the act of generating an opinion in and of itself puts us in a weird um place where we feel like we have to generate just a random bit of information that yeah, sometimes we don't have. So yeah, that was my way of, of going about that. Um I think I did like a series of pieces like some years ago, like when I was at the end of my PhD. And after that, I, I, it sort of sat on the shelf for a little while, and mainly because I, I moved country, so I live somewhere else, so like a lot of the musicians I would play with are not around me on a regular basis, but then I wasn't massively happy with the, some of the technical realities of what it means to have a visual, like a screen-based dynamic scoring system. 
which is which are not new problems. They're the same exact problems of why an ensemble would go off page for something. Like if you're looking at a stand, um, it doesn't much matter if it's a screen or a, a page. If you're if you're off, like if you're in the the notation for everything that you're doing, uh, it's a little less connected in the room. If that I'm, as I'm sure you've kind of experienced with ensembles and such. And the fact that there would be the information on the screen would change. So it means you couldn't go off page. And often there would be, it doesn't have to be, but often there would be some kind of progress bar, which again would force a kind of attention where you're like, oh, is it almost there? 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 And more than the, the general um, weight of that, I, I heard the, the sonic results of that. So if you have a, 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 a section that is going to be X length of time, um, or some kind of trajectory, let's say they do some kind of question there or something. The having a fixed duration, or, or as far as a performer goes, there's a duration and a progress bar. I found uh, really overly played into certain kinds of gestures. So if there was some kind of crescendo, it'd be like, oh, we're going, we're going, we're going, we're going. And then we'd, we'd be at like 90% for like a big chunk of it because everyone would ramp up and they're like, we're not there yet, we're not there yet, we're not there yet. And then, then it, and so it didn't have, a, it didn't feel like it was just a thing that did this, it did this. And then just waiting, or most material blocks would end up being kind of frozen while people did that. So there were um, behavioral things that I noticed that I then I, I wanted to like undo, um, which yeah is something I'm still thinking about today. But like that's that's kind of like some of the immediate reasons why it kind of ended up on the back burner shortly after like I finished my PhD. Yeah, and that makes me think of like another thing that I'm trying to like process is that. Like my composition style is very much, um, you know, write a bunch of stuff and then throw away 80% of it and then write a bunch of stuff and then throw away 80% of it. Um, but like with coding, that's sometimes a nightmare because I'll write like five cues and then say like, okay, Q1 through four suck and Q5 is great. So I'm going to move Q5 to Q1 and then like, just like constantly recycling. So just hearing a little bit about your process, especially when it's like, um, it, you know, electroacoustic and including those acoustic elements and the coding at the same time. And, and I think like out of, out of curiosity or, or semi tangentially, like when, when you pre- overproduce material this way, is it because you're, um, are there like sort of sketches that never fully material? Is it like that sort of thing where it's just like, oh, this doesn't work, this doesn't work, this doesn't work? Or is it material that you generate and have, well, I don't know, what what, what ends up on the floor and why? Let me ask more simply. Yeah, that's a good question. I, I mean, to me, inspiration in the like, I sit and wait for things to come to me and then I write them like is not, does not resonate with me in any way. I'm a lot more interested in like taking material and then doing everything I can with it and then finding what I'm interested in from like those results. Um, And so usually it's just like doing everything I can with material and then taking what I find beneficial. Um, But sometimes, especially if I'm doing something with electronics, like I think it'll sound one way and then I'll start to put it in and then it doesn't sound that way. Um, and then I've written, you know, especially if it's like Q based, then, and I want to delete Q2, then I have to switch Q3 to Q2, Q4 to Q3, and which can be its own nightmare. How much of that, uh, like how early in the process does something like that end up in the mix for you? Like, is this like at, a like, um, workshopping a piece stage that you're making these decisions about, like specifically like a Q, like I presume you mean like a, a Q in like Max or something like where you've set up a series of, yeah, essentially like presets or something. Right. Right. Yeah. The, I think for the most part, it's uh pre workshop, um, mostly just like testing. Okay. Is this what I'm expecting? I should be hearing. And then in terms of, so when you're doing this testing, what, what exactly are you listening through it? Like, are you just running like you yourself playing instruments or like virtual instruments or like what, what is what that's being processed at this point? Yeah. Typically if it's, um, if it's, so I play cello. Um, and so if I can emulate it in some way on the cello, I'll do it that way. But if I can't, I usually try to find some way to build a fake performer and then, you know, kind of oversimplistically build that into the max patch as well. 
um, with various triggers, which is relatively easy if I'm conceptualizing the max theory into the piece anyways, because I just transfer the max code into the fake performer. Yeah, I mean, that, that's a good way to go about it. I'm trying to think of like like analogs for like processes that I've done in the past. So the, the, the more recent kind of work, air quotes, that I've done has involved, um, let's say like me in a snare with, with objects and stuff, and there'll be um, not necessarily a score as such, but there might be a sequence of events. So something like a cue, like set up cues, although often when I do this, I'll have not an arbitrary amount, but I'll have a, a fixed amount of them that I navigate semi-arbitrarily. So I'll have 10 cues, and I let's say maybe originally intended them for the, you know, go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. But while performing, I'm like, okay, maybe it's time to go back to three. And I would, I would build that into the nature of the performance. But the way that these materials were generated, these cues in the first place would have come from me sitting with the instrument and just poking random bits of code on and then like, oh, this is kind of it. So I would arrive from a, um, I think this is interesting place. I will then make that then a cue where it seems like what you're describing is you're like, oh, okay, what if I do this, 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 and you'll have like an idea, make a cue, let's say in this specific uh, workflow or methodology, and then have a listen to it, which it then may not necessarily work, um, which is a, like a, a kind of like the inverse approach, I guess, or not inverse, but like it's, it's a different way to approach that, which is interesting because I think there's something to be said for that. And I think it could be quite useful because you can, Imagine beyond uh, your physical abilities, if that makes sense. So like in the, the, the way that I'm describing working, I will find things interesting in the domain in which I could have done them. Like, like I, I am capable of these things and these sounds happen. I'm like, cool, I like that. And I will then bake something in where I can do that. And then for me, I'm a big believer that in the, the course of performance and improv, then you, you extend beyond that. But fundamentally, uh, I will have done something and be like, that seems kind of interesting. I don't. I won't. Wouldn't have sat there and be like, "Oh, what is this idea?" In terms of running a little back to what you were saying, in terms of not being driven by like inspiration, um, with with uh, italics on it. What then generates like what's a like a musical idea or a conceptual idea or or a programmatic idea or whatever? Like what's what's an idea and how does that then manifest through this process of yours? Yeah, I mean, for the most part, I'll take some kind of improv experience um, and then just kind of start mining for what seems suitable. Um, for the most part, like, I've become increasingly, I guess, disenchanted with, like, absolute music, you know, more italics, um, partially because of, like, the implied meaning versus the real meaning, whatever that means, Um but like for the most part, it's uh, um, somewhat, I don't want to say arbitrary, but just like a following of wherever I'm feeling, um, whether that's like on cello or piano or whatever. Um, and then like looking back on that and saying like, okay, what, what little blips am I interested in like exploring more in this moment or this piece or what's most appropriate in this instance? Um, every so often, like with this trombone piece, it's more of narrative driven um a lot of like exploring the juxtaposition of like body movement versus instrument movement um and like learning the relationship between the two um so that drove a lot of like the material because especially with trombone like you know if i want the trombone player to move their hand but not but keep the same pitch that for the most part can only happen on a B flat or if I have some kind of rubber band that attaches to like position three or whatever, like otherwise this slide just keeps going and going until it falls off. So there's like some material that's generated just by like constraints of some kind of narrative. Um, but for the most part, it's just like experimentation and then thinking like, Oh, okay, this seems appropriate for this context. Or I feel like I can mine a lot of material out of this little excerpt. So I'm going to stick with this one. And and when you say mine, like in, in a circumstance like that, do you, what does that mean? Basically saying like, okay, how, what are all the things that I can do to this? You know, building like a mini theme and variations, I guess, just on the motif um, and seeing like all the things that are possible, I guess, um, to the point that they're no longer recognizable in which I create like a timeline of, 
okay, obviously these can't happen right away, or if they do, like, I have to know that there's not going to be a whole lot of connection made between the two ideas. Yeah. So, like, like, like I guess, like, uh, traditional, like, transformations and such, like, like just, yeah, processes of, like, the, yeah. Um... Yeah, I mean, it, it's interesting as well, like, running off the, the idea of, like, the embodiment and, and, I guess, restriction, like, instrumental restriction in terms of writing. Because I think these days I, I do very little writing for, well, I do no writing for other people, but also I do very little instrumental writing. So it, it's it's a little bit outside of my wheelhouse in terms of um, the material processes that entail that. And by that I mean, like, in, in my creative daily life. I will have been aware of these in, in in my previous lives, but it's interesting to think about in terms of the 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 places in which we can create friction as creative individuals. So that can come from like a series of limitations or a series of of uh, you know material nuggets that you might produce, and then you play off these. and And the surface area in which we create, oftentimes, is is where where things will happen. You know, in a general sense. So sometimes this can be like very practical things of this instrument has like this fixed range or, or there are these characteristics of which are relatively unique to specific ranges or or whatever it is there's no no shortage of of um practical limitations that can then be a jumping off point is this something that you'd be wanting to have a better way of communicating because i guess the initial prompt was like coming from like a like a dynamic score system or some sort of generative or algorithmic system like have you done much of work in that domain or like with pieces like that or? Yeah. I, I mean, I'm just now starting out with like experimenting with a lot of that. A lot of the previous stuff that I've done is more exp um, like traditional notation to some extent. Um, but I think, and this to like tie back to a little bit of the email, um, I think part of it is, you know, I'm, I'm less interested now in like writing like pieces for other performers to just perform. Um, and I think part of the reason for that is that like, you know, when I'm approaching these pieces and thinking like, okay, I have to write these, you know, ideas and then do all this coding. Like if I imagine doing the coding for the sake of like learning how to code or like teaching other people it, it's like super interesting. But when it's in the context of like making the piece, I'm like, ugh. I really don't want to do this. Um, and so <laughs> I'm like trying to figure out how much of that is just like, you know, the personality of me not enjoying it and how much of it is me being, I guess, like lazy or not having my process developed fully yet. Interesting. Huh. I mean, where, where's your head on that at the moment? Like which, which of those is it? <laughs> um, I think for the most part, it's leaning more towards the um, like, my personality um and i the reason because that also intersects with the like space that i occupy in like the music world um and you know the more pieces i write the more space i am theoretically trying to take up to some extent um whereas if it's like as you mentioned um in like one of the other um videos and i know in your blog post like when you're teaching there there's like this web of art generation. Whereas like if I'm just creating the piece, like there's the, the one acorn, but if you're like, the, you know, it's like the composer is like the acorn. And then like the teacher is like the tree that bears the acorns, I think in some ways. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's a funny thing that, cause I, I think like the, the, the situation, like as you are situated, what else? there's a lot of scopes in which that can occupy. So one is like, like, I guess what you mean here is like you as the individual, but then there's also the, the role of a composer, capital C in, in, in the world of uh, new music or contemporary music. Um, all of these have, have different domains and scales and sizes and, and, and larger contexts in which they sit. But yeah, I mean, for me, like, is I think I've, uh, I mean, we've not talked about, it, but I've, I've probably talked about it some length is in terms of like how one relates to that and what one's place for that. And which is why for me, a lot, I find a lot of interest and in, in satisfaction, not that this need be satisfying, but having a more web-based approach, not web page, but, um, distributed approach, like helping multiple people make multiple bits of art and just being one aspect of a continuum of creativity. I find personally interesting, and again, I find this satisfying, but I think that's that's somewhat besides the point. 
but it, yeah, there's something to that. And I, and I think maybe circling back to what you were saying of your personality and where um, coding specifically and electronics fits within the, the nature of your work or I guess the kind of work that, that you're involved in. And again, with some of this, it, it's it's like uh, an easy place to jump for me is is my own, like what my experiences with that have been, both as my own personal work and in, the, in like a new music context. And I'm trying to think for other analogs of this, like a, a buddy of mine, P.A. Tremblay, who was my PhD supervisor, but like he's done a lot of um, solo instrument and electronics, but coming from the world as an electronic composer. So he comes from like a background as a, like a acoustic fixed media composer moving into the world of instrumental composition, whereas I have a lot of other friends who've gone the other way. But for him, his specific approach is he almost builds the sounding results of the piece. He almost composes it in a... I mean, I don't want to specifically speak on his process, but he'll have like a, a timeline with Reaper and then audio files and then a max patch that behaves the way that he wants to do. And then the creating of the patch is like the very, very last step pre-concert. Like it, it's like... A, way at the end, like these sections will do these behaviors and he's sort of curated that whole situation leading up to that. And now I need I need a patch that will show number one, two, and three or whatever for a performer to look at. Which, yeah, in his case comes way, way, way at the very end, which was where you were describing come, this comes much earlier and is part of your cyclical process, which there's probably something to be said for the, not necessarily having a pragmatic approach because I'm not necessarily a big fan of, of pragmatism for pragmatism's sake, but for the sake of having um, something not baked in yet that needn't be baked. And even just like in like a, just a coding sense of not um, codifying or not um, simplifying or cleaning up anything that isn't yet ready to go. Because then it, there's a lot of time that it takes to do that, which may not necessarily be useful. And I, I personally, I enjoy coding a lot. I find that kind of coding somewhat tedious, like the, the tidying in these steps. So I'm generally a pretty uh, tidy coder. So like my my code is like I label everything, everything's nice and clear and, and concise and stuff. So I'm gonna just show you a horrible bit of code that it works fine. And actually this this piece gave me a lot of troubles for a lot of other technical reasons that, that um, don't necessarily bear interest now, but I just wanna show how messy and gross these things are. Because this happened in a process where I was just Iterating, testing, iterating, testing, iterating, testing. Okay, that kind of works. Okay, next one, next one, next one. So this I had like 10 cues or whatever. Like it was that kind of setup. I have uh, 10 setups. I have roughly, I made a note of what happens for each in terms of sonic processing. And then there was a lot of dynamic lighting. So I have a, a rough sketch to myself of what happens there with maybe a more detailed thing here on the right. So all of this worked and it does what it needs to do. And I move through the cues and I have a foot switch. But inside of this is, this doesn't look so bad. I mean, it doesn't look great, but let me find where the core visual stuff is, because it is horrifying. Yeah, yeah, I guess in the end, this doesn't look so bad, but there's a lot of like just shit like this where there's a bunch of stuff that shouldn't be here, like defers and defer lows and delays. And these things that like are really bad practice in terms of, um, where is, oh, everything's in here. Yeah, all of this stuff. Um, I think some of this stuff like even stops working if like if this is actually over here like it got really bad in terms of coding and some bugs I never worked out but um in an uncharacteristic way that I code this yeah look at this this is terrible but it works and I'm scared to touch any of it because it does exactly what it needs to do in the context of performance um <laughs> and for uh, for like a, as, a, as a more stark contrast, a more recent thing, not that that is messy because it's old, it's messy because of the nature in which I came up with it was like I'm sat there, I'm performing, I'm playing, I'm playing, playing, and I never went through a cleaning up phase where something like this would have. So this is a whole more recent performance patch of which any bit of mode changing happens. Yeah, like it's a completely different kind of thing. But creatively, like, this I did run through a whole other pass at the end, partially because this was part of a research project in which uh, I think other human beings might look at this code at some point. So I wanted to have something a bit more legible in terms of what other people see. Um, but more than anything, it uh, my creative thinking during that piece was different and how I was thinking about uh, my relationship to the code and the sections of code was different um, to kind of have a, 
a relatable example from my own practice to, to kind of point out. But uh, in terms of that, like how much of doing the, like a cue based approach to electroacoustic music how much of that is is like is that like a part of how you learned how to do this like what 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 led you towards that way of doing things um yeah i i mean specifically using cues i think that's you know in part just like processing things linearly um and like through you know a lot of traditional music playing um and so i just like inherited that and like as you're speaking i'm just realizing that now um but like to be honest for the most part what really interests me with like max is you know i'm like working on an improv patch um so like that stuff is i really enjoy coding that stuff i think partially because like there's no like i guess pressure to hit that goal like it's a constant experimentation whereas like with the cue based system it's like okay i have to adhere to these things these like parameters that i've set even if i don't like them and if i don't adhere to them it's a huge pain to to reset everything you know yeah yeah i mean i, th I think that's something that like uh one of the the weaknesses of max is the how clunky a, a system like that is so like something like like most daws are most me like you know non-linear editors in general but most daws specifically there's a a, a concept of time and relationship and and even in something like uh live where you might have a clip based approach instead but there's still an idea of a linear sense of time that you can move between whereas max is like i'm doing this right now and i'm doing this right now and it's like you want to switch between these two things it's like oh, i have another patch but i want to jump to this other patch in the middle of performance it's like no you can't really do, you know like there's a lot of things that would seem obvious but it isn't it, it the paradigm isn't there and there was hist i don't remember even what it's called but there was an old um timeline-ish object that was in max four or something that, that never really picked up and ended up getting dropped afterwards um but yeah it doesn't lend itself to that which is funny because it ends up being used in that environment a lot so what you end up is i don't know if that's what you're using like that q list um there's like a patch for q list where you set all your parameters and the sends and all that like there's a a, a kind of cobble together thing which most people use which is i think someone built at some point and everybody's like yeah this will do and we just all carry on with that. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, 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 it's interesting to think about these things and particularly when, when we don't often think, not through our own limitations, but we don't often think outside of our context very much or our, our processes because this is like, this is how I work. This is, uh, I find this comfortable as a way of working so I'm just going to carry on. And obviously you, you try to push yourself outside of your comfort zones a bit, but it's hard to to think outside of one's um, paradigms. Yeah. I mean, like the thing about, you know, cause I, I had built like a test um, recording of one of the pieces I've been doing for um, electroacoustic context. Um, and like, I built it in Ableton and like went so much smoother, but like the reason I'm avoiding that is because like one computer processing just like shoots through the roof fairly easily in Ableton in a way that, doesn't happen in max um but two like there's the the random generation i think at least i'm more comfortable creating in max um you know like chance operations and everything um and so like when you're speaking about you know tremblay's uh process like that definitely seems more realistic um i think for someone like me where i you know write it somewhere else where there is that linear concept and then like bring it back into max and be like okay how do i achieve this i mean i mean i, I think even even in terms of like uh because certain kinds of processes can happen quite naturally in in live like like a, a plugins or effects or like static events of like this sound world or whatever it's like you can just drag three plugins and in, in live you're good to go whereas in max that's a much bigger endeavor moving between them and having some kind of interaction becomes a little more difficult in in live which is where max really shines but i think uh the, yeah there's something to be said for that in, in terms of having a play in an environment in which you feel comfortable and then you do whatever you do to make it happen at the end like i don't know to, to use a more notation based metaphor i i'm unfamiliar with your process but um for me and uh like i do zero notation these days but when i did sibelius or something like that would be like near the very end of the process 
Like it, it wouldn't be step one, like opening up a document and like poking at notes like that. That's it's super tedious for one, but it's also like a hard place to think. And I think to a certain extent, um, that kind of work in Max very early on can also be somewhat hard to think if you have something specific in mind. I think if you're just playing with sounds and like experimenting with stuff, I think Max is really great because it's there's uh, not a lot of limits in terms of what you can do. But if you're after specific things, like, like yeah, if you're working in the context of cues, that might be um, worthwhile trying to investigate sounding results and, and like a, maybe in, in live or whatever. And then be like, okay, I really like this these effects or whatever. Let me build then the, the real version in Max, which I'll use in a performance context. It's a tricky one. And I think even just rewinding back like the, to what I was saying earlier on about uh, opining about arbitrary things so like often like if you're setting parameters like okay i need to set like the parameters for this granular synth or whatever it is 200 for and i'll do 500 here and like 600 there and I, like we end to just kind of pick these semi squarish numbers off the top of our head which you know like are easy to say and, and come up with but may not necessarily be the right numbers not that there's it necessarily needs to be the right numbers but if you sat there and you just had unlabeled knobs you might end up at very different places in terms of like what those numbers end up being to use a, a more banal example there. Yeah. Well, so one thing that I, um, like before I forget, that's like slightly changing course that I'm interested in hearing more about. Yeah. I'm working on this improv patch. Um, and the thing I'm struggling with now is like, one is that those parameters, right? Like right now I'm obsessing about controlling all of them. Right. So like, I built a stutter patch and so like controlling the speed and whether or not to reverse or go forward and what kind of waveform shapes the, the stutter. Um, and you know, I'm slowly letting go of some of those processes, but also just like the routing and the designing of the patch, um, just like which buttons to include and how those buttons relate to the sounds I'm generating. Like, I guess hearing about your process of, like designing that hierarchy, especially in like the interface um, yeah. part of it. Yeah. I mean, I think for me, I, I tend to fall very aggressively on the side of um, limited parameters and uh, a more what I would call musicianly interface. So uh, as opposed to so like a, like a, maybe a power user type of approach where every parameter is exposed as like a number box and they're all there and you tweak whatever you like. If you open up like a, when you open up just a vanilla AU in Logic or something and you just see like it's just text boxes and sliders and it's like, oh boy. And you can just, you know. So that's that's kind of like, I would I would consider maybe like a power user type thing where you can do whatever you want. Um, whereas, I, yeah, I'm a big believer in like the fewer parameters that, that tend to be behind the scenes masked or, or mixed up with other stuff. And I think a lot of that comes from the, the way in which I often perform with stuff, which will be, in my case, like my hands will be occupied or I'll be playing some kind of instrument where I don't have the mental headspace or the physical headspace to, to deal with um... 10 parameters, barely even two or three or four, like much less like the amount of parameters you would have in any typical single effect. And my, my workaround for that has generally up to this point been audio analysis, like relying very heavily on that in terms of um, I, I will control all of these things. So let's say speed, rate, envelope, and all of these things that you might have in any parameter, but I won't make uh, discrete sp decisions about that. I'm not in mid-performance. I'm like, oh man, I would like this different uh, envelope shape and like bloop, 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 and do that. Because for me, I'm of the opinion that by the time I've done that, that moment has so passed that it, it's, it's beyond useless to do that. But at the same time, I don't always want it to be the same. So yeah, my approach to it is just like set up um, a, a whole lot of testing based um, audio analysis where like all map all spectral centroid or any number of things over different courses of time and then map those to specific parameters. So if I'm playing a very bright bit of music for, you know, like over 10 seconds, I might then want to make the envelope shape a little shorter because in my head, maybe that will mean it will blah, blah, blah. Like th there's any kind of logic you apply to it, none of it which is correct or incorrect. But it will it'll generate um, a multidimensional relationship between what you're doing and the sounding results in the same way that um, when you're playing cello, as you move up, you know, the the, the neck, the, the pitch goes up, but timbre changes as well as, as you move your bow. Like there's no single parameter of 
performance. Everything is intertwined. And as you press harder, that other, th other things change. So trying to build something similar in, uh, in software. Not because I think like real world things are better, but I, I think the having like a multidimensional nested thing um, can produce a more complex result, which may or may not necessarily always be good. So my approach has generally been to do something like that. Like there's a load of parameters. I want to take a bunch of them and control them in a way that I'm not manually babysitting them, but that they're sort of being adjusted in some manner or another. And as well then having a kind of a macro type control where you're controlling a whole bunch of different processes, but through, let's say like a, a mapping metaphor or like a, a programmatic metaphor. So like um, to, to use kind of a simplistic example. So let's say I have like a motion, like a Wiimote or something, some kind of motion controller on my arm and I want to map it uh, and I have one on each arm and I want to like a theremin or something is like a bit has a bit of a metaphor. It doesn't need to be mapped that way, but as you move closer, the pitch goes up and as you move the other way, the volume goes up and we can think about this in a way of how we might think with other instruments. Like as you move your arm, the volume changes. Um, but one could easily do something like, let's say, like a cello. Like every time you you move across the antenna, it, it produces a tone. But when you stop at the bottom, the tone stops again. So you're moving through it as you would with a bow. Like so, it, it needs constant motion to produce sound. That would be a different metaphor for how you would change control amplitude in that context. Um, so I, I think having some kind of conception like that, I find to be very programmatically useful. So in this module. It does a bunch of stuff. It's it's kind of like a real time granulator. Um, it's it's I have these like up on my watch page. I, I can I can put them in the chat if if you want to have a go with them. But they're all built as Macs for live devices, so I can use them in live, which I don't often do. But they, I find them very easy to reuse in Macs because it's just a single object. But this timbre thing does a whole bunch of stuff, and in fact, it doesn't control timbre in in a conventional way. It's uh, what this is doing here is behind the scenes. Um, this is recording grains and playing them back um, based on onset. So every time you, you make a sound, it records that into a buffer and it keeps like a rolling buffer of these sounds that you've built up. And then um, every time you make a sound as well, it also plays from this collection of, of stuff. So it's basically building a short-term memory that it's then reading from. And I'll, I'll, I'll run some audio. Actually, let me open up a different patch so I can just show you an example of what that sounds like. So this timbre parameter here, um, behind the scenes, what it's doing is every time it records into this buffer, it's recording three streams of audio. So it's recording, I have to remember, right? Um, the harmonic component of a sound, the percussive component of the sound, and then the transience of the sound. So it, it decomposes a signal into three discrete streams and literally records like a three channel buffer. And then this is essentially crossfades between them. So if I set it at 50%, this is the audio being played as normal. If I put this at 100%, it's only the transients, and I'll show an example of that. And if I put it the other way, it's only the harmonic component. And then you can kind of fade between them, which I could have exposed here as like three faders. That would be cool. But I, for one, that's a hard thing to think about. So I thought the the, the metaphor in this case of timbre would be useful to to kind of wrap around that. So if I'll, I'll put this here, I'll put the blend all the way up so you can kind of hear the, the results a bit more clearly. All right, so let me show you what I mean here. So first, let me just play some of the audio. This is um, like me with a prepared snare. So just a snare with some objects on it. It's an audio file used for testing a bunch, but it just sounds like this. Okay, so that's just sort of the vanilla sound of it. So I'm just gonna turn the cloud on as, as it stands and we'll just, so you can hear kind of what it generally does. You kind of get this sort of cloud, well, that's the name, um, of grains that follow the, the percussive stuff. So I'm just going to crank the blend now so we can hear things very clearly. So with the timbre at 50%, we're going to hear um, basically everything as it is. So the, the sounds, we're going to hear them sort of granulated and played back as, well, uh, with all the components combined. So it should sound exactly, well, not exactly as they came in, but um, they're not yet broken into like their component parts. All right, so now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna play again, but I'm gonna move this around. And just to kind of state it again, the closer I get to 
the more we're hearing just the transients. And the closer I get to 0%, the more we're hearing just the harmonic component. And then along the way, it, it crossfades between the harmonic and the, the percussive and the transients. And then as I move towards up into the higher numbers here, it goes more purely uh, percussive. And then finally at the end, only transient. So I'll just let it play while I massage that around. So the bottom end here, it's, it's almost ghostly. It's, it's just like this kind of oh, 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 oh. Whereas up here, you get this very clear kind of sounds. Um, so I'll put the blend back to normal here. And what I find interesting with this is that as I move this around, it brings the, it almost brings a metaphor for full circle because it's, it's impacting the timbre of the overall of the processed audio. So as I bring this up, we'll hear less of the body of it, like the harmonic bit, and we just hear the like almost like little popcorn bits popping through. And if I move it this way, it's interesting because you get like this sort of hummy rumble of the all the grain playback, but with none of the cutting through. So uh, here we go. So here it's almost like, like, like popcorn in the background. So yeah, that, that's something that like I've spent uh, like a fair amount of time thinking about in a general sense of like what I find interesting while I'm performing, what I want to have control of, and what I think is a useful like musical control uh, as I said like this sort of nested parameters where nothing is discrete and even in the sense of like um like I have like a modular synth over here and I didn't get into it for a long time and even now I haven't used it a ton but I um I don't like the I I, I don't find it terribly inspiring or interesting to be like I have this one oscillator and that oscillator is going to go into a filter and then that one filter is going to go into an amplifier and these are three completely separate things that that are you know have a uh, completely different parameters and controls um, I don't find that massively interesting you know you can obviously do a ton of cool stuff with that and, and and many people have and I've gotten some results that I've been somewhat happy with that but I find it more interesting when there's like a, a single knob that that controls the angle or I'm giving you a concrete example here of, of, a, of an oscillator type from the, this instrument designer Seat Lombard where he makes analog synths but it'll morph from let's say like a, a like a sawtooth wave this way to a sawtooth dig this way, but independently. So the, the pitch and the timbre are affected at the same time. So they're, neither one is separate because you're not controlling the overall period of the waveform. Um, you're controlling the shape of each segment, which in effect changes the pitch and the timbre at the same time. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I love that idea. And because I, I remember I've been listening to one of the other um, videos. I remember who the... Uh, Giovanni, um, and you oh, were yeah. talking about the um, the ways in which we were pro programming the spectral centroid. Um, yeah. yeah, like just ways of um, monitoring or like the onsets and the ways in which that would affect other parameters. Because um, I think like conceptually, I'm very much um, like I want to be in that more like natural development thing or like programming the changes to happen on their own. But like in practice, I keep doing the power user thing over and over and then I don't yeah. realize it until it's too late. Yeah, I mean, it, it's it's a super useful way to do it. And like to, to kind of come back to PA, uh, my PA Tremblay, he's super power user. Like he he wants individual control for everything. His, his real-time performance setup when we play together is he'll have, I think, an iPad or two with literally those individual knobs for everything and he'll be using his mouse during a performance which to me is horrifying but you know he gets the job done so there's there's it's not to be said that like uh there's right or wrong ways to do it whereas i think that is actually the wrong way to do it but i think um for me yeah, I, I prefer a more abstracted thing it is difficult to, to to um arrive somewhere um musical that way or it like so for example if you take something like spectral centroid which is like you can just run your cello into that 
and again, a number that comes out and it'll, as you get brighter, it'll go higher. And as you get darker, it'll go lower. And it, it like the relationship between what you're doing and, and the numbers are very clear. Cool. What on earth do you do with that? Um, that's where it starts getting a little, um, a little funkier. So then you just start randomly pulling it into different parameters. Oh, it, so literally mapping one to the other and that works, but that, okay, that's kind of okay. Okay, then you play with the ranges of them. So the range of this to the range of that, and that's kind of useful. Um, then you start playing with different kinds of smoothing. So it's changing slowly over time instead of moving quickly. And oh, okay, that's that's kind of interesting. And then you um, have like thresholds. So if it's above this number, it turns on. And if it's below this number, it turns off. And you start doing all these variations to the number. And then for one, you can use that one number to control a lot of things. But then also you can have... Um, you can start getting a sense of what might be interesting to do with it. Because I think coding, like many things, so, I don't know, let, let me take, like, let's say, like, uh, sitar. Do you know much about sitar? No, I'll but... Yeah, so me neither. If I asked you to write a piece for sitar, um, and, I, and I plopped, like, here, now you have a sitar, you know, what would you do? Like, just in, a, in like, a real-world sense. Like, you've got, like, two months or whatever, like... Yeah, I mean, largely experimenting with what I could all do with the the instrument um, and then getting a sense of what's possible, what's not possible, and then starting to craft material or, like, write those limitations and then be, like, practical about, okay, what things can I achieve? What should I be avoiding? Um, and then how can these things all relate to one another? Yeah, which is what I think I would probably do as well, and I think a lot of people would would do this, and I think... I would probably also maybe try to find videos, but it doesn't matter. We're not, we're not writing for, for sitar. But the, the idea being that it's um, it's hard to have... I, I tried to, just tried to pick an arbitrary instrument that I, I thought you may not know, but um, to have ideas in a domain that we have zero ideas about. So our first ideas about uh, something we don't know about will be like probably the same for everybody. We'd be like, oh, what if I do it this way? What if I mess with the tune? Like, you know, we'll have like all these clever ideas um, but there's, they're pretty superficial um, in terms of like how meaningful they can be. Uh, it's not until we like learn a little bit about something that we can then have ideas about it. And I think descriptors in, in a specific sense, but like coding in a larger sense is very similar. Like without, without knowing much about architecture, I'm not going to design an interesting building. I may have like, oh, like what if I made the building like a, a circle, but it's upside down and like half of it's missing. And it's like, oh, it's crazy. But then like, you know, I, I don't know what I'm talking about, which is fine. But also like those are stupid ideas. So like it, 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 it's kind of a funny thing. So I think all of that was to say is that with a lot of things like with descriptors and my experience with this, it was literally doing that, just literally mapping them like, oh, that's kind of okay cool and then like trying different versions of, of some of those permutations i said like scaling them and slewing them smoothing them thresholding them i've been getting into more recently like secondary type things so rate of change over time so velocity and acceleration how fast a, a parameter is moving i'm giving you another bit of information so using all of that to connect to a bunch of stuff um to where like i have like um like a video thing where i'm using like a a single fader like a crossfader thing and then i have that one fader mapped to like nine things so like its position um it's uh change in speed over time how how far it moved from where it moved to and then back um the distance between the two places that it moved how long it took between those like all of these second it's literally just one fader but then all of a sudden it's controlling in this case a whole synth um and that produces kind of interesting results that are all intertwined but all of that was to say that it's hard to find a, a footing in to playing with these things that isn't just playing with these things it, which is like the, like the cruelest joke you know it's like one of those things that like when you're young someone tells you oh like you just gotta you just gotta go do it and you'll you'll figure it out as you go and it's like that sounds so stupid <laughs> but then it's like no you, you you just gotta go and do it and you'll you'll figure it out on your own <laughs>
um, what, what other stuff are you kind of doing with, let's say, like an improv patch? Like, do you have a patch that you generally improvise with? Like, do you have already a thing or? Yeah, so I had built a one in Ableton um, just because I was being lazy about coding last year. Um, and then I ended up switching to Max just because I had a little more time and I wanted you know, my processing for my poor computer was at like 60% the whole time. Um, but I'm trying, I'm really interested in like an improv patch that is large, relies on interdependency. Um, one that for the most part, um, at least the patch I'm building now, like I can't do on my own. Um, I'm fairly interested in like, like this forcing of community almost, um, by, you know, relying on others and then like exchanging of ideas like kind of literally um in real time um which makes part of like practicing really hard right because like i can't if i'm on my own you know and i'm like practicing with a recording that's not gonna be able to respond to me um but like yeah for the most part it's um i'm still kind of in the stage of like oh here's something like, cool i can do and then like i do it and then when i'm practicing i'm like this is useless I'm not ever going to use this again. Um, and so, and I've done a lot of like, you know, I have like a stutter and then I, I'm trying to build this like pitch scatter thing, which is, you know, conceptually interesting. And I have no idea how to achieve it without sounding like, like cheesy. I think like pitch variation without, you know, adding a lot of processing, I'm having trouble figuring out, um, without it just sounding like, a you know, like when you're speeding up a tape and then it just start, starts to sound like nasally. Um, you know, so some of these patches I'm slowly working through. Um, and I think the thing that I keep running into is that, that routing. Um, and right now, like what I'm doing is I'll build each of these effects, like stutter, delay, pitch scatter. Um, and then I'll have like buttons like, okay, route the stutter to the filter delay and then route the filter delay to the pitch scatter. Um, whereas like, as we're talking about it, it seems a lot more practical to say like, okay, this button sets these parameters that automatically routes these things together. Um, and then like a couple of, maybe a couple of extra buttons to like change the parameters of that routing specifically. Um, and I think that like also frees up, you know, like Sam Pluta in his thesis talks about like flow, right? Or, um, just like the, the subconscious kind of leading the way. And I think that that's one of my issues with like power user um, interface is that it really doesn't lend that kind of, it makes it harder to lend to your subconscious because you're constantly trying to work out like, okay, which button means what? How am I like making sure I'm not clipping or whatever? Um, so I, I think like that's my long ramble about where my, my improv patches. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I'm I'm in a big agreement with with Sam on that front in terms of the like the the speed of intuition and how quickly one can think that way. I'm a little. Uh, I tend to be also a little bit dubious of my own intuition as well. In that, I think intuition can be very comfortable. So, like you might more often, it'd be like the the analog equivalent of like or, uh, physical equivalent of like licks. Like you might have certain licks that come out, and like if you're just in the flow, you might just be spewing licks. <laughs> Which is, um, so I, I, I tend to always have a little bit of reservation as well and have, try to have like a, a non-intuition based um, prompt or, or uh, point of friction involved. But I think, yeah, um, the routing one's an interesting one. It's something that I, I wrestle with a bunch now. Out of, like when, um, in your coding and stuff, like do you wrap things in polys? Like do you do, you do like CPU muting oh. and all that? Yeah, I'm slowly getting better with it. Um, and like my routing now is largely based in matrix, but I don't know what it is. Like conceptually, it like makes me grumpy to use matrix as opposed to like um, like a send and then like sending a message of like send to here instead of here or whatever. Um, so for the most, like I have matrix, but like visually, especially like translating that into the OSC, like that's part of the other thing, like coding in the patch is fine and making the OSC is fine, but then creating the relationship between the two that seems like appropriate is when it gets to be like, I just don't know where to begin, you know? Yeah. And with the OSC, you're talking about like an uh, iPad or something. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, with that, I, I, do you tend to use different uh, setups on your iPad? Like is it different interfaces or is it like generally the same interface? I mean, I, I, this is part of the issue, but I, 
you know, I use Touch OSC mainly, and so I'll build it around my patch. So I'm never using an interface that's predetermined. Um, I'm always starting from scratch as I'm building the patch. Um, so I'm like, I'm removing not only all limitations of like electronic possibilities, but then also all like controller possibilities. Um, and like I've tried experimenting with, um, I have a nano control, um, but like even trying to conceptualize routing in that sense has been tricky at some points. I think, I mean, I don't know if you've played with Mira much, like, you know, the Max app Mira. That'd be worthwhile just to have a play in terms of, because like with, I think one of my older performance patches, I had a Touch OSC setup, which was great. But then I was like, oh, I'd like to have another fader. Maybe if I get, get replaced this thing, and it's like, you got to go in the editor and you change everything. And then you got to go in your patch and change it. It's like a whole thing, which is fine. But like, if, if you're still vibing it out, something like Mira, where you can literally just drag interface objects and be like, yeah, this, and then just easily test and you don't have to worry about mapping. So that, that'd be worthwhile just having a go with. And I think they updated it recently, which is cool. Um, but the routing thing, so matrix. So there's, there's in Max, there's not a very good way to completely change the order of um, a signal path with no delay. So with matrix, um, you can you can change stuff, but you can't go back in to itself, or you can use send and receive tildes, which is cool, but they add a vector of delay, which I don't know. If, yeah, so I I tend to not do them for anything I do because with the I'm super anal about trying to get like very very little latency with stuff. But one thing that I've been um, w playing with and I'm building now is the idea of having let's say like uh, in. Uh, Ableton or Logic or whatever, like you have a plugin slot and then in that one slot you can be like, oh no, I want to load a different plugin and you load a different plugin, but that one slot is still like the send or whatever is still one send is having every a DSP unit in your patch um, be every one of your plugins. Meaning that like the first slot is your stutter, your pitch, your distortion, your filter, whatever. They're all there. And the next one, they're all there and they're all there and they're all there and they're all muted. So if you enable like uh, pitch distortion filter and gate, they're all on. And now I want gate distortion, uh, gate stutter filter distortion, and all of them turn on and off accordingly. And that, unless you have like a, a mega computer, isn't going to be happy unless you're muting everything as you go, which is um, even with that, it, it starts getting a little heavy because on load, everything's enabled and then gets muted. So like your load would be a spike. So I think, um, yeah, routing is a, is a tricky one. And it's something that I'm, I'm personally dealing a lot with at the moment because I think it can be super, super cool, particularly once you start getting like, um, I built this stuff a, a couple years ago where, where I had like these, all of my effects had these splits thing built into it. So uh, let's say I have a distortion effect. I can send the, the signal through it. Great. You can have a wet, dry, like fine. But I wanted to be able to send basically anything above a certain volume to the distortion. So almost like a noise gate, but like the stuff that passes the gate to the distortion or vice versa. I wanted to be able to do the same with like a crossover. So like anything above a certain frequency or below goes to the distortion. And then uh, having like that harmonic percussive separation. So any one of those components. So being able to do that with every effect. And then once you cascade some things like that, so like you have your signal coming in, only the loud parts are going to the distortion and then the clean parts are going through. Of the clean parts, only the frequencies above 10K are going to a reverb. Okay, and of, of the part that isn't, that's going down. And then from there, um, only the percussive parts will go to here and here. You get like this basically like a, a cascading thing where it's, you have um, serial processing and parallel processing. And if you imagine like kind of like a little tree like this, you can have a pretty complex just DSP setup, which is I think like Sam's patch can do this stuff. Like Sam Pluto's, not patch, his super collider setup has this kind of funky signal routing, which is super awesome and, and really interesting because you can use like pretty core nuggets like that, just even just distortion filters, EQs and things like that, and do some really complex things because of how the signal is moving around, um, which you can build in Max, no problem. But it's a lot harder to then change it. And that's where I, I, I'm personally at the moment struggling with that. Um, because, yeah, there's not a, a good way to do that in Max that I know of. If, if someone knows, I would love to know. But, 
Because, yeah, matrix, you can't feed back on itself. And um, you can do sends and receives, but then you add a vector every time you do that. So that's not ideal either. I think in the most recent version of Max, which I haven't actually played around with this feature, but inside a poly, you can have more than one of different kinds of patches loaded. So let's say you have like a four voice poly, like a poly with a four. Each one of those can be different patches, which is new as of Max 8 something, I, but I, I haven't actually played with that yet. That, that could be kind of cool for doing some uh, parallel processing. Yeah, because I haven't played with that either, but it sounds like it would solve a lot of problems that I've been <laughs> running into. Um, and to like, I guess, go back to one of the earlier things, and you know, I don't want to take too much time, so you know, um, whenever you need to leave, it's understandable, obviously. Um, but like, you had talked a little bit earlier about um, the like, keep going, and then you'll just know when you're like there type idea um and so like to kind of tie this back to like a bigger picture thing um like it's clear that you've worn a lot of hats um over your lifetime and like you know that's something that really interests me like rabbit holes and like digging deeper into a specific idea um but i think a lot of times i get stuck with like knowing which rabbit hole to go down at that specific moment um so i guess talking a little bit about like what what has triggered those sh shifts in like, okay, I'm going to wear this hat now. I'm going to stop yeah, wearing yeah. this one. I think for a lot of them, they weren't massively deliberate. So like, for example, I grew up like playing classical piano <clears throat> and then um, I started playing guitar and bands and those were like the kind of the genesis of that. And then everything and those, the piano was because my family got me into it. And then the guitar was because they had a guitar and then um, they hated that I played guitar, so that made me want to play guitar. So those two were kind of defined for me. But then after that, I think like I, I, I would play a little bass while we were playing bands, and then a, a friend of mine's band needed like a bass player full time, and I was like, "Fuck it, I'll pl I'll play bass." And then I ended up playing drums for similar reasons. So just kind of funky life things that just come at you like this way. Like I, I played um, this video game called EverQuest, which was like an old MMORPG for like hardcore for like two years and like I was just like oh this is kind of good and then two years later I'm here like playing eight ten hours a day you know like just to like okay I'm doing this now like so none of um some of those kind of decisions weren't necessarily deliberate I wasn't just like all right I'm gonna really get into this now it just you're wandering around or I'm wandering around in like um uh bemused kind of curious state like oh that's kind of oh look at that oh, that's good and then like then before you know it, you're, you know, you're a professional speed flower arranger, you know. Like the other day I was watching a video on like speed cup stacking, you know, like where they do that. And I have no interest in that, but I was like, man, maybe I can get a, some cups and just learn how, you know, just <laughs> to do something random like that. Some of it is just chasing the whim for me, like in terms of like the curiosity of it, which has the aggregate effect of, of having done like a, a half or over half a lifetime of this kind of thing is that I've done a lot of these things and I've also done them fairly earnestly. Like while I was a bass player, like I was a bass player. That's what I did. I played in bands. I played bass um, and I had opinions about all that kind of stuff. When I was a like a new music performer, I had opinions about that. Like it, it's each of these things were fairly encompassing like I, I wasn't like oh you know what I'm gonna like I'm gonna become like a weekend jogger now which which would be fine to do but I didn't approach it that way like I, I was just like I'm, I'm doing this now and this is what I'm doing and then just yeah after a few iterations of that um you end up with this backlog of things you've done but I think for me it's, it's just that like chasing the whim and like well, this seems kind of interesting and then just going with it as as ridiculous or arbitrary as it is I'm a big fan and believer of that even if it has no relation to art or music or anything. Um, and then beyond that is like uh, just getting proper into it and just like uh, not viewing it as, um, I mean, this was my experience. I, I don't know that I would necessarily say to do that, but my personality and disposition is that whilst I was doing those things, I was doing those things, you know, like I, I wasn't thinking about other stuff. It wasn't like a side gig, you know? Yeah, that, that's how it kind of unfolded for me. I, and I, I've, at, at the... You know, having done that for a while, I I have enjoyed that I have done that. You know, that I, I can 
have this sort of uh, breadth of experience and, 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 and knowledge and also these different things because it, as it turns out, has also helped what I do now. Even, all that stuff, like even just all the EverQuest playing really gave me a good understanding of like min-maxing and things and how to like... And also, randomly enough, I was reminded of, of this kind of openness and sharing. I got really into writing guides for like specific quests like there's this, this one quest and it was really tedious and like, you know, if you do it, it was like a solo necromancer, but you have to do these steps. So you're going to got to go here and I was like whole long forum post, like doing basically this, you know, like proto this, you know, which is funny to think back on. Um, That's awesome. Yeah. I love that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, what, 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 what has been any of your past lives as such, or what, what's, what's a future past life going to look like? Yeah. I mean, I definitely am interested, like. Political theory is very interesting to me in the way in which that relates to music um, and like community building and the ways in which like, you know, like one of the reasons I'm interested in opera is um, like this notion, which kind of like is, I guess, borrowed from Afrofuturism of like building better realities in the future, um, which like to me is one of the reasons I'm less interested in absolute music because it's not like there, there isn't a whole lot of definition always or it's very easy I think to maybe like misunderstand whereas like you know when you're building these like explicit narratives um i think it's a little bit clearer um and that's like something that i'm super interested in and the way in which like we can use sound um to and like music and stories to help build those like ideas of what could exist um and like i think one of the things that i guess I'm trying to process is this idea, um, R. Murray Schaefer calls it sound imperialism, like, the ways in which we take up, like, sound space, um, and, like, the ways in which it relates to nature, right, like, there are certain bird calls that signify certain things, and so sometimes I, like, get paranoid, like, I'd be interested in creating this, you know, improv patch that, like, takes in, like, just going in the forest and just taking in the sound that exists there, um, and then I'm like, what if I like accidentally send a signal that's like construed by some animal as like a distress signal or something? Um, and you know, like it, he also talks a lot about like the ways in which sound and noise is like inundated in our daily lives. Um, and so it, there's like this weight of like, or I don't want to say like hubris cause that seems like a strong word, but like, of, like, oh, my sound deserves to be added to what is already such like a heavily noisy world um and so like trying to process like the implications of those um like the literal space that i can take up right like and the ways in which my the sound i'm creating relates to those larger contexts is um i guess to tie it back to like the question like the ways in which like environmentalism um and like understanding community not just like person to person but like person to nature and per person to space like how those things all relate um and understanding like my role in those things and and would you would this, does this fall under like this sort of past life or future life or this is just like a side life yeah i think like both side life and future life um i definitely like one thing that I think about often is just, like, this desire to split my mind into, like, a bunch of different people and explore all of these things, because, like, practically can't do all of them in one lifetime. Um, I think that's part of that, that, that issue I was talking about, like, all these rabbit holes that I want to explore right now, but every time I, like, explore one of them, I'm like, okay, well, I can't, I don't have the time to explore this one, or, like, every time I'm exploring one of them, I'm like... Ah, uh, you're you're losing your chance to study this one or this one, which you know is its own thing to to process. Um, but yeah, like back burner lives, I think yeah. is is my answer. No, that's that's quite beautiful, and I think it's something like yeah, I, I think quite a lot about it, like in the context in which we live. I don't often think about so much about this in like a uh, not a post human, but as in like a, a an other human, as in like like environment. I don't often think about it in terms of the situation of that, but it is obviously like a significant thing, particularly now, you know, and and how things are going. <laughs> to just ask as a, a quick little side thing, like for just for clarifying. So when you say absolute music, what do you mean by that? Yeah, that's a good question. I think like 
Um, I, to me, music, which, like, I guess has the, like, threnody of Hiroshima, uh, effect, where, like, you can just, like, throw a title on and it changes the meaning, right? Like, you can't do that with a story, like, a, an explicit written story. Like, if I write The Giving Tree and then I throw on the title threnody of Hiroshima, they're gonna be like, why would you call it this? Um, whereas with music, like, it, or like absolute music, so to speak, it's a lot more um, easy to like mold to some kind of narrative. Um, right, I see. Okay. And I think that's part of why I'm less interested, I guess, in it is because it's so easy to, or it seems very easy to either like misunderstand or manipulate to some kind of context um, and rarely like has any like... Um, post experiential uh teachings i guess um as in like something like threnody like doesn't say anything about what to do next right it, it conveys like something that happened um and perhaps like the emotion but it doesn't like make commentary so much on like nuclear weapons or nuclear weapons in relationship to a particular country or whatever um yeah. which i think like stories can um and so i think like for the most part to go back like absolute music is largely uh um the narrative is very fluid um and i think that's what concern is what is not super interesting to me ab about that um and at least with like improv um which like i guess you could define as absolute um in some sense but it's also very community based and i think contextual and also like expresses some kind of individuality um and relationship between the performers um which i think is harder with absolute music because it almost removes that context of composer from performer in some cases yeah, yeah totally i mean yeah it's a whole i mean not exclusively but they both tend to produce sounding results that other people tend to listen to but like beyond that they're they're made and organized and structured in like un, like massively different ways which is, I think, largely part of like the 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 world in which and how they were generated, like with their backgrounds and, and all that kind of stuff. You know, like I first got Instagram like when I was twelve or thirteen, you know, and have been posting things on there ever since, and would spend hours upon hours just scrolling. Um, and so I feel like you you put a lot of value, like, you spend a lot of time on that, so you put a lot of value in it, I guess. I'm never really away from work. We're never, I'm never away from work. I'm never, it doesn't matter that I'm not physically present. I, and they all know. a human being that you could interact with it would be 100 like we all know those conversations we've had where the person you're talking to is being surface level and not sharing anything meaningful we've all had that conversation um and i think that's what your phone would do it would just be like sharing facts like, look at this 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 I guess as part of this, like being aware of your context and your environment and specifically in, in, in the capital E environment, do you envision like a version of yourself that is no longer a capital C composer or, or making sound at all? Like, I think I partially reject like the capital C composer notion, just like, I think it's called E English, something like that. Like this notion of removing like to be. Um, so instead of like, you are capital C composer, like you are someone who composes, um, right. and like, that's far more interesting to me. Um, and I think like, it, it's not so much that I see myself as in danger of not composing anymore as it is like composing, like, um, with the intent of taking up space a lot less often. Um, and I think a lot of that has to do with like intention, like, okay, why am I doing this? Um, and you know to 
I think, especially, like, with identity, um, it just, like, again, feels, like, kind of hubristic. Like, there's plenty of things I enjoy hearing, like, without even listening to, like, just going outside, right? And so um, if I'm not adding to that, then I'm replacing it. Um, and it feels um, strange to be like, okay, what I am writing now is more important than what you would be listening to otherwise. Um, and so, like, I think there's just, like, a lot of responsibility um, to take in exploring that. Um, that's not to say, like, I wouldn't do it, um, but I think taking a lot more seriously um, that expression. Um, but I, th I there's also, like, a lot of privilege, I guess, in that expression, too, right? Like, my type of my type of voice is heard very often, right? And it doesn't always feel like I have something new to say. Um, and so th I think that's part of that intention and that rarity is that like, um, if it doesn't feel like something new to say, that's also significant enough to like replace what's already existing, um, then it doesn't feel useful to like pursue, I guess. <laughs> No, I, I totally get that. And it's it's interesting to think about because I think to a certain extent there's like a um like a zero sum perception. So like for example, if like if we were launched into space or something like this, like if we're in infinite space and infinite time, um the there would be infinite things to listen to. So nothing would replace anything else or nothing would be concurrent potentially with anything else. So the there obviously we live on a planet and we live near other things that are alive. So there is um we do live in like a finite environment in which you're either you personally are either listening to this or you're listening to something else or or a couple of things simultaneously. But um perception is centered around a human, you know, like like our facility, whereas I think an environment doesn't necessarily have perception as such you know 
So it, it's almost like project, like all of this is to say, it's kind of interesting that we almost anthropomorphize um, fucking up the environment. Like, like, like we, we become an agent in how the environment is fucked up because it is itself then being, uh, we're listening to shitty composed music, not that say your music should, but like we're listening to capital C composed music that's shitty in lieu of birds or something else. Whereas in, in reality, there's there's the the real impact that we're having on the environment is is on a scale that's greater than that, but it's also different. But we are like we have to picture the the environment as a person before we can picture that we're fucking it up. Is I guess right. kind of right. the roundabout way of saying that. Yeah, and like I think an extension because it's to me it's not just like um, replacing like listening to the environment, but like inward listening as well, right? Like you know there is music that can contribute to that type of listening. But I think especially with like capital C composing, that context is removed. Um, and so it makes it a lot harder for that music to achieve that um, in some way. And so like even if we're in space in a vacuum, um, like that music does replace some type of sound that's already existing, like sound as in like oral or sound as in like some kind of metaphysical um, sound that manifests like within ourselves. Um, and so like, there's always like this replacement, I think, or like hierarchy of where my sound is located. And I, it's just like that intention of like, okay, this is something that I feel comfortable implying needs to be at the top of the hierarchy for X amount of time. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> it's cool. I, I, I like this stuff because this stuff that like, is is very adjacent to stuff I often think about and things that we often talk about, but not in uh, not in some of this framing, which is it's cool to have a chat and, and think about some of that specifically. Yeah, there's this really cool uh, con- Barry Truex, uh, I think, is the one who like I guess founded this. He has this book called Square Inch of Silence, um, and like his whole goal as um, I remember what like acoustic environmentalist there's like a specific word for it um audio ecologist i think is what it's called um but he talks about this forest um i think in the southwest or maybe the northwest where he just wants one square inch that is completely uninhibited by like human sound which like theoretically sounds fairly easy but especially because of the existence of airplanes is incredibly difficult um and so he talks about, like, you know, if we work towards building that one space of, like, silence, um, as in, like, non-human or industrial noise, I suppose, um, like, that reverberates because you're creating this sphere of, like, non-influence. Um, and I think we very much perceive, like, unto- like, national parks being untouched as explicitly in a physical way and not so much in a sound way, which I think is like a super interesting thing to, to like continue exploring, um, especially in regards to like U.S. coming to terms with colonialism and everything. I remember something like like ages ago when I was studying astronomy. Astronomy. I was, uh, I'm always on the verge of fucking that one up. But yeah, like the amount of light pollution, which you don't often think about. So even like in, in very remote places, like I live in the, the, the woods here in Portugal, but there's still like a, a fairly significant amount of light pollution, which is if you're studying this kind of stuff, that's a big problem. And I think um, a, a probably a bigger scale than like the sound pollution thing in terms of like, I think it, the, where you can go to get away from man-made light is starts getting really, really complicated. But the same as planes, because planes go all over the place. So, yeah. Cool. Yeah, I, I I really enjoyed that. I think. Uh, I mean, I don't know if you're happy with the sort of the conversation that we had. Yeah, no, this was awesome. Like, thank you so yeah. much. Um, yeah. And I really appreciate it. Not just like for my sake, but just like from a like I guess capitalized social standpoint. You know. <laughs>